Um, so, uh, yeah, welcome to the uh, um, first workshop of the uh, program. Um, we uh, have uh, a lot of free talks, um, but we have to schedule some of light to facilitate discussions. Um, so, uh, I hope that all of you will have uh, plenty of, of, of uh, plenty of opportunity to uh, discuss open problems. In fact, um, we kept uh, the um, Thursday afternoon free, so um, yeah, please use that as an opportunity to um, to talk to one another. And um, if you haven't kind of solved all the problems by Thursday afternoon, um, there's the opportunity on Friday uh, for to give uh, lightning talks on um, uh, kind of questions that you find interesting or uh, observations. And for this, uh, you can either email the organizers, so that would be uh, Ani Krishna uh, or Nicola Del Foss or myself. And you can also sign up on Zulip. Um, so I will maybe kind of I know write down the the URL uh, later, um, and you can kind of use that to kind of organize yourselves. Um, I think that's pretty much it. What I wanted to say. Um, ah, yeah, one one thing. Um, we have one additional talk, so we are very happy um, that uh, Robert Kelberbank um, agreed to give a talk. Um, after the reception today. So he will give a talk uh, titled uh, Back to the Future. And this will be uh, a historical overview over the history of coding theory uh, through the lens of uh, Reed Muller codes. Um, okay, and with this, uh, I hand over to uh, Louis Golovich, who will uh, give the first talk of the workshop uh, on um, yeah, some introduction uh, on uh, quantum LPC codes. Yeah. Please take it away. Thanks, Nico. So yeah, I'll just be giving a kind of a high-level introduction to quantum LDPC codes. And at a very high level, quantum LDPC codes or QLDPC codes are simply a way of correcting errors on quantum states using measurements are of low weight or measurements that involve few qubits. So we're going to be having some encoding of a quantum state such that we can go in with these measurements, each of which just touches a few, like a constant number of, of qubits. And somehow by processing the measurement outcomes, we'll be able to recover our original code state. Now, if we want to have a way of kind of maintaining a fault tolerance computation or even just a fault tolerant, a fault -tolerant memory, we really want quantum LDPC codes that can protect against as many errors as possible that we're resilient against as high a rate of, of faults as possible, um, but also LDPC codes that are efficiently decodable. We can't kind of take too long to do this decoding procedure because we're going to want to be continuously doing these measurements to continuously correct against errors. So to give an overview of the history of these, of these codes, for many years, the Torah code or the surface code, which I'll be describing in a bit, was close to state of the art, both in terms of some theoretical parameters as well as in terms of practical performance, at least in numerical simulations. And yet recently, in the past maybe five to 10 years, there's been much more interest in QLDPC codes that are based on kind of classical codes and product, products of classical codes and expander graphs. So they're, they're really in a different flavor than the Toric code, though, as we'll see, in some sense, these, these newer codes still do generalize the Toric code. These newer codes are interesting because in certain respects, they can give asymptotically optimal performance. And they also seem to have the potential to yield good finite, finite size performance in, even in near-term devices. So kind of both in the asymptotic regime and in the finite size regime, these, these expander-based guilty PC codes seem to show promise. And this is the reason that we're really interested in them, and it's a very active area of research, which we're gonna be hearing a lot more about throughout this week. So this is just an outline of the talk. I'll give a, some brief background on QLDPC CSS codes, which is just the general framework that we'll use about, that I'll, that I'll use in this talk to describe LDPC codes. And then I'll describe the Toric code, before describing how it generalizes to these hypergraph product codes, which as I mentioned are products of, of classical codes based on expander graphs. And then I'll describe how these, these codes in turn were generalized and improved to obtain these asymptotically good QLDPC codes. But asymptotic performance doesn't always translate into practical performance, so I'll discuss some of the 
of the things we need to think about when actually looking at implementing these codes in physical devices. Then I'll turn to the, the computational problem of doing efficient decoding on these codes. And I'll wrap up with some, some open questions in future directions. So at a high level, the way that we do error correction with QLD PC codes is we start with some length k, uh, some length k message, or k, say, logical qubits, which we encode into n, the greater number n of physical qubits, such that if some bounded error occurs, say an error occurs on at most, say, d of these physical qubits, then we can perform some stabilizer measurements and recover the original message. And the key point is that these stabilizer measurements are low weight. That's the low density and low density parity check. So maybe we'll measure, say, the tensor product of these three Pauli x's, or the tensor product of the, these three Pauli x's. And maybe we'll also measure the tensor product of some Pauli z's, some more Pauli z's, and so forth. And we'll do these low weight Pauli stabilizer measurements, where we measure all these Pauli operators, each of which touches a few different qubits. And by doing some post-processing on these measurement outcomes, we can decode and recover the original message. So what are the kind of the parameters to look at, the things we want to optimize in this general setup? Because this is just the general setup for decoding with LDPC codes. The first thing to think about is just the, the number of message qubits or the number of logical qubits. Ideally, this number is not too much smaller than the number of physical qubits. And the ratio of k to n is known as the rate of the code, and that we want to be high. It means that our encoding doesn't have too much redundancy. We, of course, care about the number of errors that we're resilient against. We want the number of errors that we can, pro we can protect against to be as large as possible. We, of course, want these stabilizer measurements to be low weight. Intuitively, if we perform a high weight stabilizer measurement, we need to do an entangling measurement across many different qubits, which itself could incur more errors than we're correcting against with the code. Whereas ideally, a low weight measurement will just touch a few different qubits so it won't introduce too many additional errors. And overall, kind of, we'll correct more errors than we introduce. There's also some additional considerations. So maybe if our qubits are laid out in some uh, topology in a physical device, we'd want these stabilizer measurements to be spatially local within this topology so that kind of we don't need to connect far away qubits that might be difficult to connect. And we also really want efficient decoding. So these are kind of the different things I'm going to be talking about how we optimize, how we think about with QLD PC codes. But first, I think I should just give a brief like minute or two just describing the CSS framework, as this will underlie basically all the codes I'm going to talk about. So a CSS code at a high level is represented by a tripartite graph. In the middle, we have the code qubits. On the left, we have x stabilizers. And on the right, we have z stabilizers. So each vertex on the left represents x stabilizer, meaning it's a tensor product of these Pauli x's on these code qubits that it's incident to. And similarly, every vertex on the right, which is a z stabilizer, represents the tensor product of Pauli z's on the vertices that it's incident to. And you can see that this x and z, these two x and z stabilizers, intersect on exactly two qubits, so that the two operators, the tensor product of Pauli x's and of Pauli z's, commute. And indeed, we always need our, stabilize, our stabilizers to commute. So any vertex on the left and any vertex on the right will have their neighborhoods intersect at an even number of positions. So the code space, or the set of encoded logical states, is simply the set of all states in our Hilbert space that lie in the simultaneous plus one eigenspace of all of the stabilizers. So it's just the, the cats that are literally stabilized by the stabilizers. The dimension, or the number of logical qubits that are code, that are code in codes, is always at least the number of code qubits minus the number of stabilizers. And to talk about the, the distance of our code, we need this notion of logical operators. So a logical operator is a Pauli operator that commutes with all the stabilizers, but is not itself a product of stabilizers. So for instance, the tensor product of these two Pauli z's, we could check it commutes with all of the stabilizers but is not itself generated by these stabilizers, by the z stabilizers. 
So this is a logical operator. And the distance of our code is the minimum weight of a logical operator. So the distance of this code would actually be two. And intuitively, a logical operator, since it commutes with all the stabilizers, is a Pauli operator that we can apply kind of without any of the stabilizer measurements detecting that we applied it. So it's an undetectable error that our code cannot protect against. And intuitively, we should expect the distance, therefore, to measure something about kind of the minimum weight error that we cannot protect against. And indeed, we can always decode from roughly half the distance. So if any d minus 1 over 2 of the qubits are corrupted adversarially, we can decode and re uh, recover the original code state. But beyond this threshold, uh, we lose this guarantee. We may not be able to detect or, or correct the errors. And finally, the locality of the code is basically the maximum degree of this tripartite graph. And it, it also uh, measures the, the maximum weight of any of these stabilizers. So for LDPC codes, which are the focus of this talk, we have constant locality. Great. So that's it for CSS background. I'm now going to go on to describing the toric code, which, as I mentioned, is kind of where this story starts in terms of studying LDPC codes. So intuitively, the toric code is based topologically on the torus, as its name suggests. And to make this a discrete object that we can actually deal with like discrete qubits on, we want to tile the torus. So we simply will take a square tiling of the torus. Here I've only drawn it on a part, but we'll extend this square tiling to the entire torus. And we place qubits of our code on the edges of this, of this tiling. So every edge is a qubit. On every vertex, we'll place an X stabilizer. <coughs> so for instance, on this vertex, we have an X stabilizer, which is simply the tensor product of the Pauli Xs on the four qubits or the four edges incident to this vertex. So every X stabilizer has weight four. And the squares in the tiling are Z stabilizers. So every, every square is the tensor product, represents the tensor product of Pauli Zs on the four edges of that square. So all our squares all our z-stabilizers also have weight 4. And we can see that these x and z-stabilizers commute. Because, for instance, the two I've drawn here don't even touch each other at all, so they trivially commute. And if we took, say, this z-stabilizer and looked at the x-stabilizer on one of the vertices of this square, we would see that the, this vertex intersects this square at two edges, at this top edge and at this left edge. And since Pauli xx commutes with Pauli zz, these two stabilizers commute. So basically, because every square and every point intersect at zero or two edges, um, all our stabilizers commute. So we have a well-defined CSS code. We saw that the locality is four. And something to maybe keep in mind for later in the talk is that all of these checks are spatially local on a 2D torus. All of the stabilizers only affect qubits kind of that are locally in a local neighborhood um, within the topology of this torus. <coughs> So to understand the distance of this code, we want to understand the logical operators. And as we saw, by definition, a logical operator is something that commutes with all the x stabilizers. And so here I've drawn an example of something that commutes with all the x stabilizers. It's a tensor product of Pauli z's. And to commute with a given of these x stabilizers, we essentially need some number of Pauli z's on edges, such that we have an even number of these chosen edges incident to that vertex. Because essentially, a tensor product of Pauli z's commutes with a tensor product of Pauli x's if there's kind of an even overlap between the supports. So basically, basically, what this is saying is that a logical z is a set of edges where we put a Pauli z on every edge such that we hit every vertex an even number of times. And in graph theory, we have a name for that. It's called a cycle. So a, lo a logical z, it seems like it should just be kind of any cycle of edges in this tiling of the torus. We also need this to not be a product of z-stabilizers. And this example I've drawn here is a product of the z-stabilizers in these three squares. So it's actually not a logical operator. And really, the reason for that is that it's, it, this, this, um, this operator I've drawn is itself a boundary of this region given by these three squares. So a logical z-operator is a cycle that's not a boundary. 
Now, if we take this cycle, the cycle wrapping around the hole in the torus, we see that this actually is a logical Z operator. It's still a cycle, but it's not itself a boundary because there's no way to essentially fill in this cycle with some set of squares such that this cycle is the boundary of that filling. And similarly, we can also take this cycle, um, kind of going around the torus this way, that again is a cycle in the torus that's not a boundary. So we have these kind of two non-trivial logical Z operators, and it's the same story for logical Xs. We kind of get two different non-trivial cycles because we're now looking at kind of a dual lattice type view. The cycles are now uh, kind of, they more look like a ladder than just this smooth cycle I've drawn, but at a high level, there's still two, two non-trivial logical X operators. So what we've seen is that this n qubit toric code, if there's like big n edges in this entire tiling, has dimension two, because there's two logical x and z operators. So it encodes two logical qubits. But the distance is the length of the shortest cycle. And that's going to be roughly the square root of the number of edges. Intuitively, you could imagine kind of cutting open and unwrapping this, tor this torus, kind of laying it out in a square. Um, it would be like, uh, root n by root n square, where the area is n here, and so kind of the length of this square, which is root n, is the length of the shortest cycle. And so the kind of the one of the big focuses in the study of QLD PC codes is just beating these parameters from the toric code. In particular, this distance parameter was very tricky to beat, um, but in general, just kind of beating the toric code is really where this story starts. So one natural approach, which you may be thinking here, is just to tile more elaborate manifolds. So what if we have two holes in the torus? I mean, now since we have two holes, we have, we'll have double the number of non-trivial cycles. So unsurprisingly, the dimension of our code will double. But the distance is still going to be on the order of root n. And in fact, using this type of approach, we don't know how to get optimal parameters. So if we introduce even more, even more holes, the dimension will continue to increase, but actually the distance will start to decrease. And it turns out that to, to ultimately get better QLD PC codes, and in particular to improve the distance, we're going to want to generalize the toric code in a very different direction than just kind of adding holes or looking at more elaborate manifolds. And so now I'm going to talk about hypergraph product codes, which are this generalization of the toric code that's going to prove more useful. So the key observation here is that the torus itself is actually topologically a product of two cycles. It's a purely topological statement. But to say something about codes, we want to tile these, these objects again. So we can tile the torus, which is a, a two-dimensional manifold using this kind of 2D grid, as we saw, and we get the toric code. And we can tile a cycle, which is a one-dimensional manifold, by simply just splitting it into like a cycle graph to make it discrete. In a cycle graph, we can actually view as a classical repetition code. We just put code bits on edges, and every vertex is a parity check that literally just checks that the two edges incident to it are equal. So going around the cycle, the checks collectively enforce that all of the, all of the code bits are equal, and that's the definition of a repetition code. So it seems like the toric code is the product of two, the quantum toric code is the product of two classical repetition codes. And indeed, we can actually take products like this um, for arbitrary classical codes. So if we have a classical code C1, another classical code C2, then we can take their product, in particular the hypergraph product, and we'll get some quantum code Q. And what's interesting is that if these classical codes are asymptotically good, so their dimension and distance grow linearly, with the number of bits. So essentially, they have asymptotically optimal parameters. And say they're LDPC classical codes, so they have constant locality. Then we're going to get a quantum LDPC code with, again, linear dimension, so a, a linear number of logical qubits. Um, but the distance will not, it will not be linear in the number of qubits. It will actually grow as the square root of the number of qubits. So in terms of dimension, in terms of logical qubits, we're doing much better than the toric code. In terms of distance, we're still matching the toric code.
treating the two classical codes with respect to X and Z. So yeah, I'm going to describe that later. So this is just the high-level description of the parameters, but exactly where I'm going. So yeah, so we're going to need to find a way of constructing this hypergraph product code from two classical codes. I will first just give some background on classical codes and then show the construction. So a classical code, or a classical, I guess in the purpose of this talk, I'll only be talking about linear codes. This is simply a linear subspace of the vector space f2 to the n. So it's a set of bit strings and length n bit strings that's closed under addition mod 2. And we can describe this classical linear code via something called a Tanner graph. It's a bipartite graph where we have n vertices on the left and r vertices on the right. The left represents the code bits, so we have n code bits. And we call the right vertices the parity checks. The locality, again, is the degree. It's the maximum weight of any parity check. This is analogous to the quantum case. And really, this is kind of half of the quantum picture. Quantumly, we had a tripartite graph. Classically, we only have a, a bipartite graph. And intuitively, that's because classically, we kind of only need to correct against bit flips or Z errors or X errors, not phase flips. So unsurprisingly, classical code words are assignments of the code bits, like to binary assignments of the code bits such that every parity check sees an even number of ones in its neighborhood. So for instance, we can take this assignment. This is a wait for assignment. There's four ones. And if we look at the outgoing edges from these ones, we see that every parity check here receives an even number of red edges. Every parity check sees an even number of ones in its neighborhood. So all parity checks pass. And that means that we have a valid code word. Now, the distance of a classical code is, again, the minimum weight of any non-zero code word. So if this is kind of the minimum weight code word, this code could have distance 4. In particular, we've shown that this code is distance at most 4. The dimension or the number of kind of logical bits classically is always at least n minus r, the number of code bits minus the number of parity checks. And this just follows from basic linear algebra, because the code is a, it's a vector space. Uh, specified by R linear constraints in N variables. So I'm now going to describe how we get good distance classically. And this will also really be the driving intuition behind how we get good distance quantumly for quantum LDPC codes. So the key point is that if this Tanner graph has a property called expansion, then our, our classical Tanner, our classical LDPC code will have good distance. So going back to our, our picture of our Tanner graph, at a high level, expansion means that small sets of vertices on the left, or I guess low weight assignments, so assignments with just a small number of ones on the left, have proportionally large neighborhoods when we pass to the neighborhood of this small set on the right. And it turns out that this property, that small sets on the left have large neighborhoods on the right, directly implies that we have many violated parity checks for any sufficiently small set here. So just to, to say why that is, if we imagine the small set has basically an almost optimally large neighborhood on the right, the only way for that to happen is for all the outgoing edges from this set, or for almost all of the outgoing edges, edges from this set, to lead to distinct vertices on the right. Because if we have too many collisions, if too many of these outgoing edges kind of lead to the same vertex, then our, our edges are collapsing onto each other, so the neighborhood won't be as large as possible. But if instead, if kind of all these edges are leading to different vertices, then most of these vertices in the neighborhood receive a single edge incoming from, this, from our small set on the left. And this means that kind of each of these vertices has just a single red edge coming in. And since one is an odd number, it means that the associated parity check fails. So we can see that um, essentially any low, weight, any low weight assignment on the left violates many parity checks, so it's not a code word. So our code words can only be high weight assignments. Uh, in other words, all of our code words will have large weight if this graph is a good enough expander. And that's kind of intuitively how we conclude good distance from expansion in classical codes. Great. So I'll now just go back to this hypergraph product construction, where we now have two classical codes, and we want to construct a quantum code. 
And you might see the terminology like product of chain complexes. That's another way of saying what I'm going to describe. So say we have two classical codes. I'll now draw the Tanner graph for C1 vertically here, but it's still just an ordinary classical Tanner graph. And C2 has a Tanner graph up here. For simplicity, I'm assuming that the codes have the same value of n and r, but that's not necessary. And we'll describe, define the qubits of our hypergraph product to essentially come in two grids. There's an n by n grid of qubits and an r by r grid of qubits. So in total, we have n squared plus r squared qubits in our, in our quantum code that we're defining. We then have an n by r grid of x stabilizers and an r by n grid of z stabilizers. So in total, we have two n r stabilizers. And I now just need to define, I've told you how many of everything we have. I just need to define what are the edges in this quantum tanner graph, or more specifically, if I choose a vertex over here, what are the edges it's incident to? Or what is the x stabilizer that this vertex defines? So to do that, we can literally just kind of look at the picture. And first, starting at this vertex, we can travel left to the associated vertex in the classical Tanner graph of C1, and travel upwards to the associated vertex in the classical Tanner graph of C2. We have a vertex in each of our classical Tanner graphs. We can now pass to their neighborhoods. Um, so we now have a set, of a set of vertices in C1 and a set of vertices in C2 just the neighborhoods of these two original vertices. And now we're going to pass back down into the, into the qubits. So we just take this neighborhood down here and just slide it into the column that we started at. And similarly, we take these vertices in our classical graph in C2 and just slide them down into the row that we started in. And you can see now we have a set, a subset of the qubits. And we're just going to define this stabilizer to be the tensor product of Pauli x's on all of these qubits that we've arrived at. So it's a tensor product of some qubits in the row that we started in and some qubits in the column that we started in. And you can see this ends up being like a weight five X stabilizer. Now we can do the same thing for Z stabilizers. So say we choose this vertex down here and we wanna know what is the Z stabilizer represents. We travel left and up to get two vertices in the classical Tanner graphs pass to their neighborhoods to get a set of vertices in each classical Tanner graph. And again, drag this set down into the row, into the column that we started in. And we end up with a tensor product of Pauli z's on five qubits in our, hyper, in our hypergraph product. So this is a z stabilizer. And you can see that the x and z stabilizers that we're looking at here actually intersect on exactly two qubits, this one and this one. So they commute. And this will actually always happen because essentially, if these stabilizers ever intersect up here, then we can kind of complete out the rectangle with the two vertices that we started in, and we'll find in a point of intersection down here. So this construction, and this construction stabilizers always intersect at zero or two qubits, so they all commute. So we have a well-defined CSS code. And I mentioned that this is a generalization of the Torah code. So we should be able to place the Torah code in this framework, where each of the classical codes is a, is a repetition code. And indeed, the Torah code actually has two types of qubits, if you look at it carefully. It is the qubits that are vertical edges, in the sense that they're edges uh, that come from cycles that go through the whole of the, the whole of the donut. There's also horizontal edges, edges that come from cycles that wrap around the whole of the donut. And so indeed, our hypergraph product also has two types of qubits. So that matches up. And then our vertices in the Torah code are x stabilizers, our squares are z stabilizers. So the Torah code fits in this framework. And I think now I just want to describe intuitively how we can obtain logical operators in the hypergraph product from classical code words in the, in the classical uh, codes. It turns out that if we have a classical code word, say in C2, say it's 110011, then we'll get a logical operator in the hypergraph product code, literally by just dragging this code word down into one of the rows of this grid and placing Pauli z's where we had ones. So the tensor product of these four Pauli z's is a logical operator. And actually, this will happen 
uh, we, we could actually get a similar thing, but a different logical operator by just putting the same classical code word in a different row of this grid. So basically, by putting the classical code word um, in different rows of this grid of qubits, we can get different logical operators. And because classical code words lift to, classical, lift to quantum logical operators, it should be not too surprising that the classical parameters of our classical codes say something about the... Yeah. I, I was just curious if the like, topology of the Tor code is also apparent from this construction by taking two, um, if I take two repetition codes and I build up a Tor code this way, can I see that it lives on a torus? Um, sorry, I'm not sure. Like, it, so I can I can get like a list of logical operators, and I can get a list of um, these uh, um, like parity checks. But can I can I see how the qubits should be arranged so that they're like a, nicely sitting on a torus? I see. So I think I think I mean so this product of as I mentioned of chain complexes is really a topological product. I'm um, a kind of I guess comes from like algebraic topology or homological algebra. So in some sense, I think that like this is very topological, though as I've described it, kind of in this formulation, there's I've kind of done away with the at least kind of the spatial structure. Um, so maybe it would help. So in order to see it for this specific example, you would have to interleave the checks of the 1D repetition code with the qubits of the 1D repetition code. So instead of N in a block and then R in a block, you would like uh, interleave them a little bit and do the same thing for C2. Then when you take the hypergraph product code, what you'll find is that everything tiles nicely uh, the same way it does with the Toric code. And uh, you know, I, I don't know about boundary conditions, but I, I mean, it's probably, you know, work out a small example and you'll see it's like, the, the layout is topologically this 2D plane that you're sort of expecting um, from the geometry of the Torah code, but you know, as he was saying, like this is this is a topological product in some algebraic sense, but uh, that doesn't mean that you always have a great sense of the geometry that results. I'm driving. Actually, a product of cycles is a torus. It's a well-known fact, and it yes. is exactly in this. Yes, that's what I'm saying. But I'm saying also, if you have some more complicated thing, I don't think you can expect to have a great picture of the geometry that results. Uh, from this, but you can characterize it up. In fact, in fact, it's partially, you know, the, the, the partial uh, locality of the closest you see because it's a cycle code, and uh, because if you have a cycle, the kernel code I is a cycle and has, you know, just local connection. And basically, the, the locally special um, behavior of the closest code you see because it has, it comes from a kernel code which is especially local, actually, somehow. And anywhere, anytime you take something, it's especially local, you get this kind of picture. Thank you. Thanks. Great, so thanks for the question, yeah. Um, so I guess the, the, right, so the classical parameters um, of these classical codes should say something about the, the quantum parameters of this quantum code. And indeed, we see that um, at least maybe the distance is easier to see since classical code words seem to lift directly to quantum code words. Under some, some assumptions on the classical Tanner graphs, it will always hold that the distance of the quantum code or the minimum weight, weight of a quantum logical operator is the minimum of the distances of the two classical codes. Meanwhile, it's going to also turn out that the dimension of the, of the quantum hypergraph product code is the product of the dimensions of the two classical codes. And this is maybe a little harder to see from the picture I've drawn because um, it seems like we're kind of just lifting classical codes from C1 or C2. But really, you can see that um, we have all the choices of the code words in C2. And we can also put them in different, um, in different rows of this matrix. So maybe it's not too surprising that the dimension is the product of the dimensions of the classical codes. So how do we go beyond this? How do we improve the hypergraph product? 
So to summarize everything I've said in case kind of you zoned out during the construction, um, the product of two classical good LDPC codes is a quantum LDPC code with dimension growing linearly in the number of the number of qubits, but distance growing as the square root of the number of qubits. And it's natural to ask, how can we further improve the distance of this code? Because this square root n is still the same as the toric code up to constants. If we actually have these be repetition codes, it literally is the, the toric code. And so it turns out that very literally, we want to introduce a twist in our notion of a product. So now I'll briefly describe how we can go from this construction to asymptotically good QLD PC codes. We take the Torah code and look at, uh, I guess we recall that the distance of this code is the length of the shortest cycle. Then it turns out that the cycle length will increase if we cut open and twist the torus. So if we kind of cut the torus here and then just twist it, so we kind of, like we've cut it open, so it's now a pipe and we just twist this pipe. So we twist the two ends apart from each other. Then the cycle, kind of the two ends of the cycle will be dragged away from each other. And to reconnect up this and make it a closed cycle again, we're gonna have to kind of add in an additional segment to connect the two ends that we've dragged away from each other. And this will actually increase the length of the cycle because we have to add this additional segment, this red segment here. And so the cycle length increases and that means that the distance of this, of this code increases once we've twisted it. Now, unfortunately, for the toric code, twisting can only increase the distance by a constant factor. But a recent line of work, um, very beautiful recent work, has applied similar ideas, but in a much more elaborate manner to actually obtain QLD PC codes of distance going beyond um, roughly root n. So this line of work accumulated in actually asymptotically good QLD PC codes where the distance and the dimension grow linearly with the number of qubits. So how do we take the notion of twist? I mean, you know, you would imagine that if you were just taking a cycle, you know, in this direction and you, you bumped it off by a little bit, it would still be a small, you know, it would, it would be a deformation of the same cycle. So what makes it the twist? Uh, right. So, I, yeah, I agree in this example, it's not maybe a direct generalization though you could imagine. Um, so I think one, one answer is that we're kind of using, a, we're using a group symmetry uh, with this twist. We're using the fact that we have symmetry with this cyclic group. And you can imagine like taking a product of two um, cycles or two repetition codes, um, but somehow modding out by this, um, this again, cyclic symmetry. And if we mod out in a way that's kind of not trivial, if we mod out uh, maybe a diagonal cyclic symmetry, I think you can start to see how you could apply this type of idea <coughs> to a torus. I don't know if that's, that is not true. Sorry, I mean, I should probably have drawn it out in more detail. Sorry, was there another question? Actually, I, I thought that this, uh, uh, Quotient, quotienting procedure is rather than increasing the distance, I thought it's decreasing the number of qubits. Am I wrong? Yes. So I guess it increases the relative distance. Um, so indeed, it's also, yeah, so it's not the same as this. Yeah, so that's a good point. The quotienting procedure is, yeah, so it's not the, the same as this exact twist I've described. Um, it is, I guess it is similar in the sense that in both cases, you're taking some group symmetry and kind of using it to kind of take parity checks that originally were kind of just um, like constrained to like rows and columns in this, in this product. And you're kind of using them to kind of twist them and send them to things that are far away. Um, so yeah, sorry, I guess it's not, it's not a perfect analogy. Um, I think it's the intuition of using the cyclics, because I think the key point is kind of this cyclic symmetry um, is what allowed us to twist the torus uh, in this example. And if we have a larger group symmetry, we can kind of twist the parity checks in more elaborate ways. Um, 
Okay, so um, I probably uh, don't want to spend too much more time on these asymptotically good kill DPC codes because um, I think for more details, Nico gave a couple of great talks describing these um, in the boot camp, which there's videos of. Um, but for this talk, I'll now just give some considerations for applying these codes in physical devices and then decoding um, and finish up with some future. So when we're, when we're looking at applying these codes in physical devices, something that is very important but hasn't really come up yet in what I've talked about is spatial locality. So in a physical device, like in our, in our real world, qubits will lie in a three-dimensional Euclidean space. And in some devices, like in some superconducting devices, this is actually more restrained to like a 2D lattice of qubits or something. And depending on the, how the, the physical device is built, measurements involving far away qubits may actually be expensive. So in a superconducting device, or maybe we can only kind of natively do entangling interactions between qubits that are literally next to each other in this lattice, it may be difficult to do one of our stabilizer measurements if it involves a qubit here, a qubit here, and a qubit here, even though this is only like a weight three stabilizer measurement. So in the LDPC framework I've described so far, this seems like it should be a very, very low weight measurement, but in a physical device that can only do neighbor to neighbor interactions, we may have to kind of involve qubits in paths connecting these, these three qubits, which might be expensive. So a natural question is, what are the best QLD PC codes with spatially local stabilizer measurements? That is, how, how good can the rate and distance of our QLD PC code be if we restrict the measurements that look something like this, where we only involve qubits in some like constant radius in our, in our Euclidean topology. Now it turns out that uh, the best in T dimensions, the best possible QLD PC codes have these parameters. For n qubits, they have dimension growing as n to the T minus two over T and distance growing as n to the T minus one over T. And the intuition why we can't get asymptotically good codes in, finite, in a finite number of dimensions is that somehow spatial locality is at odds with expansion. Intuitively, we need some form of expansion to get good distance. Um, but I haven't, I don't claim to have proven this at all. And somehow it's hard to get good expansion in like a low dimensional Euclidean space. So for instance, if we just plug in t equals two and look at this bound, we see that the toric code, or really the surface code, which is what happens when we essentially cut open the torus and lay it flat, is optimal. It saturates this bound. And in higher dimensions, there's been a, a nice line of work, which I think we'll be hearing about later this week, that similarly roughly saturates this bound, um, but no, we can no longer just use something like a toric code. In fact, for t at least three, this distance is beyond root n, so that should be suggestive that we'll need to use these codes in this recent line of work I described. And indeed, these constructions go by embedding these, these good QLD PC codes into, into, into Euclidean space. I think we'll also be hearing later about this later this week about kind of other ways to circumvent the limitations of spatial locality. There might be kind of other ways to maybe use a good QLD PC code, even if the checks aren't truly local and somehow still perform syndrome extractor, extraction circuits um, in some fault tolerant way. Right, so in getting these codes to physical devices, spatial locality is one concern, um, but I just wanna highlight a couple of recent works that have um, kind of given kind of prominent proposals for how we may do this in the near future. So one way is this paper, which I think we'll be hearing about from later today, that actually shows that you can embed QLD PC codes into a bilayer architecture um, for some very concrete finite size codes. So instead of kind of having a single 2D lattice, in this paper they have a pair of 2D lattices that are stacked on top of each other, which might be amenable to superconducting qubits at some point. And they show that you can embed some, some pretty good QLD PC codes that um, outperform the surface code, at least um, even in some certain finite sizes, into this architecture. Meanwhile, there's a, another recent paper that took a different approach 
They use the fact that neutral atom devices, which are different from superconducting devices, permit certain forms of long-range connectivity. And using that, they showed how you could fault-tolerantly perform syndrome extraction for QLDPC codes. Um, so there's just a couple of papers showing that QLDPC yeah. um, I didn't mean to interrupt your sentence, but uh, like, um, can, you, can you abstract some of these out and say, well, it's not spatial locality, but you know, you can do rotations or something, you know, can, can, you, can you abstract some of these out and say, here's the new constraint that you, you want. Uh, it's not spatial locality, but the following kind of, um, of connectivity. Yeah, so I think at least for this one, which might be easier to see, I think the, the key point is they could in parallel kind of move entire rows of qubits in a 2D lattice. And in this hypergraph product construction that I described earlier, there was kind of a symmetry across different rows. Like the stabilizers had the same structure across, or I guess in a, like across all the different rows, the stabilizers had the same structure. So you could really benefit from this, like these devices permit this parallel processing across rows or across columns, which you can really benefit from in the stabilizer extraction circuits, by essentially measuring all the stabilizers um, of a given form at the same time across all the rows. I think that's maybe at a high level um, one reason that this, this approach works well. But, yeah, so I guess these are just kind of two, two papers that um, I think we'll hear more about, at least about some of the ICE ideas later this week. And they show that QLDPC codes may not be too far away from being realized in physical devices. I should say that these works describe how to get a fault tolerant memory out of QLDPC codes, to perform logical operations or computation on this memory, they actually essentially just teleport the logical qubits out of the code, perform the logical operator, the logical operation on maybe like a little surface code patch, and then teleport back in. And as I'll describe later, this still seems a bit inefficient, and it's somewhat of an open question to, to actually perform fault tolerant computation directly on QLDPC codes. So now we'll talk a bit about decoding. So large code distance ensures that decoding from many errors is information theoretically possible. But it is a separate question as to whether it can be done efficiently. And this is really important in practice when we'll typically be uh, doing a lot of syndrome measurements And we want to repeatedly be doing these syndrome measurements and decoding in order to continuously correct the errors that are arising. We really want the decoding to be very efficient. Now, it turns out that asymptotically, this problem is somewhat solved in the sense that there are uh, these asymptotically good quantum LDPC codes or even codes that aren't asymptotically good but can correct against like random errors. And it's been shown that you can correct against a linear number of errors in linear time or in parallel like logarithmic time. So asymptotically, kind of good decoding is possible, I guess is the takeaway from, from these works. But getting good constant factors is very important for practical fault tolerance. Uh, with a lot of these asymptotically good codes, the constants are so bad that in practice, the threshold at which uh, decoding starts to kick in and uh, correct more errors than it, than it creates, um, this threshold will be very low. And these, some of these constructions will kind of never uh, in their current state, be useful in practice. So I'll now describe the challenge with QLDPC decoding, because even in the asymptotic case, um, even for these works, uh, they need to do something beyond just the kind of what's done classically. And there's this key challenge that really arises with seemingly basically all decoding of quantum LDPC codes, which is this idea of degeneracy. This is the observation that low weight stabilizers, which we need by definition for QLDPC codes, yield many short cycles in the QLDPC Tanner graphs, in these tripartite graphs I was, I was drawing earlier. And this can somehow cause classical decoders to, to get stuck. So just to give an example, a very simple example, if we go back to the Torah code, um, if we have a say a, an error that consists of like poly Z or two poly Zs just on two of these edges that are incident to each other. 
the syndrome will essentially be these two x stabilizers. Essentially, because each of these x stabilizers sees an odd number of edges in the air, whereas all of the other x stabilizers see an even number of edges. Now, it turns out that this error, if we instead had these two Pauli z's in our error, will actually produce the same syndrome. Essentially, these two errors produce the exact same syndrome consisting of these two vertices, or these two x stabilizers will detect the error. And fortunately, these errors differ by a stabilizer. So they're logically equivalent, meaning that if our decoder um, corrected, kind of applied either error to invert it, it would, have the, it would still recover the original logical code state. So it doesn't matter which error occurs. It doesn't matter which of these two errors we correct. But a classical decoders aren't very good with this type of reasoning. They don't really understand that there can be different low weight errors that um, have the same logical effect. And at a high level, classical decoders kind of won't know which of these to do. And a, as a result, they could get stuck. So that's, I think, the very high level challenge with PLD PC decoding. Um, we can do another example. Um, I might, due to time, maybe not give kind of all the details, but just at a high level, maybe say kind of a more explicit stylized classical decoder that actually uses an expanding classical code, and maybe briefly say kind of why this fails quantumly, or at least how we can fix it quantumly. But um, intuitively, if we take classical codes where small errors, recall expansion means that if we have a, an expanding classical code, small errors have proportionally large syndromes. One like very nice in theory classical decoding algorithm, though that might be suboptimal in practice, is this just flipped algorithm. And that's just the algorithm that kind of greedily finds and flips um, code bits that reduce the syndrome weight. So if our error was originally these two bits, our syndrome is these four red boxes here. We can see that we can first flip this bit, which will reduce the syndrome by two. And then just greedily, we see that we can then flip this remaining error bit and again, reduce the, the syndrome by two. So just greedily kind of flipping code bits in a way that reduces parity checks actually turns out to correct a linear number of errors for sufficiently expanding Tanner graphs in the classical case. It turns out that this algorithm fails quantumly. In particular, if we look at hypergraph product codes, uh, again, this is our uh, construction of a hypergraph product. And if we consider kind of an X stabilizer, um, which this X stabilizer is the tensor product of these four Pauli Xs, it turns out that if we consider X errors on half of the stabilizer, so an X error on say this qubit and on this qubit, but not on the other two qubits in the stabilizer, so just half of the stabilizer, um, we look at an error. Then the decoder, you can just believe me that it will re receive this syndrome, so just two Z stabilizers will fail. And it turns out that if we try to flip any individual bit, so perform an, kind of a Pauli X on any of the qubits, then our syndrome will not decrease. Um, so I won't go through that in detail. Hopefully you can just believe me uh, in this case. Um, but I guess I'll just show two examples. So if we flip this code bit here, if we apply, apply a Pauli X here, the syndrome will change, but it will not decrease. So this was our original syndrome. Performing an X flip here makes our syndrome look like this. So it's still of weight two, but it's changed. Similarly, if we flip this code bit, if we apply a Pauli X here, our syndrome will again change. So it'll now look like these two Z stabilizers will fail. But again, our syndrome hasn't decreased in weight. And so in general, our syndrome will never decrease in weight by a single X flip. But if we allow ourselves to flip multiple bits at once, we actually can correct the errors. So if we allow ourselves to flip any set of bits, apply any, any set of Pauli Xs that are supported within a single stabilizer, then in the example I've given, trivially, this will kind of correct the error because we defined our error to be supported within X stabilizer. So we can just flip the two, the two bits that occurred, and our syndrome cleans up. We've recovered the logical state. And in general, this small set flip algorithm, where we allow the decoder to flip small sets of qubits at a time, instead of just classically where we could flip a single bit at a time, um, turns out to be the generalization that we need to generalize this flip algorithm to the quantum case. So I think that's all I really want to say about decoding. Um, I think the next talk will probably go much more in depth into this problem. But hopefully that gives kind of a flavor of what's going on.
And I think I'll just conclude with highlighting a couple of um, open questions. So one question is whether we can get more practical constructions of good quantum LDPC codes and decoding algorithms. So here I've like lifted a screenshot from like a paper by Panel Ivan Kalachev on this topic. And really the point here is that kind of in practice, what we want is we want to write down like very explicit codes with very explicit constructions, like where we can ideally like know exactly what the rate and distance are, um, look at the numerical performance. And the point is that asymptotic performance is not necessarily equivalent to finite size performance um, on like a physical device. Now, um, that's not to say that the two aren't related. Um, a lot of our best codes for finite size performance are at least motivated by study, studying um, constructions in the asymptotic case. Um, but I think there's a lot of interesting open questions in terms of getting good finite size performance of QLDPC codes both for code constructions and for efficient decoding algorithms. And maybe one way to approach that is to get more constructions of asymptotically good codes. Maybe that will be suggestive of ways to also get kind of finite size codes that perform better in practice. All that is to say kind of getting more constructions both asymptotically and in, in finite size instances is, is an interesting question. And another, another direction for future work is kind of doing efficient fault tolerant logical operations on QLDPC codes. So um, here I've lifted a picture from um, this paper I mentioned earlier, uh, using neutral atoms to give a proposal for um, fault tolerant memories with QLDPC codes. And the, the big point here is that fault tolerant memory is not equal to computation. So in this paper, they had a big QLDPC code to get a fault tolerant memory. They had to teleport qubits into some, some small surface code patches to perform logical computation, and then teleport back into the memory to, to get the storage benefits from the LDPC code. So kind of finding a way to maybe uh, get around this teleportation and maybe do computation directly on the QLDPC block, um, I think is, a, again, kind of an interesting open question. And there's also many more directions. So I basically just listed these two because I think they tie in nicely to the things I've talked about in this talk. But I think this week we'll be hearing about a lot of more um, exciting, exciting open directions and current work on these codes. So that's all I have. Thank you. So I think, yeah, oh, thanks. So the question I think was kind of how does, um, correct me if I've got the question wrong, but I think the question was how do, like, can I just repeat kind of how classical code words lift to logical operators? Um, so I think, yeah, so if we just take this classical code word and just stick it in one of these rows here, then kind of the, the stabilizers here, you recall the stabilizer will essentially be incident to, it'll take the structure of the parity check from this classical code and then also there will be some edges going down. Now the edges going down don't have any effect um, on this logical operator because we've this logical this thing I'm claiming as a logical operator has no support down here. So edges from this stabilizer from this vertex going down will have not will have no effect on like commuting properties. But the edges from here um, going this way precisely inherit their structure from the classical Tanner graph. So because all of these parity checks pass for a code word, that means that kind of all of these stabilizers will pass for this Pauli operator. Um, because we literally are just taking the structure of the classical Tanner graph and sticking it into this row here. Um, so maybe, yeah, just to repeat that, I think we're taking the classical Tanner graph, we're sticking it onto this row, and we're adding some additional downward edges that don't matter because we haven't put any Pauli Zs down here. Our Pauli Zs are all up here. 
don't know if that. I wasn't. I wasn't quite seeing how this is not a product of the other state. Oh, how this is not a product of other state. I can see that this commutes with all the, everything else. That's fine. But as the fact that they also have to be not a product. Right. Um, so yeah. That I wasn't see. so clear to me. I see. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah, I didn't prove that. And in general, um, it actually, is possible that I think I think it is possible that some rows here might be the product of stabilizers. Um, so I was definitely glossing over that. Um, you have to be a little careful. If this, um, if these classical codes have certain properties, um, like I think if the parity check matrix is full rank, um, then, uh, and if you use certain properties about the parity check matrix, you can kind of ensure what you need. Um, in full generality, the, the logical operators are going to be things when we take a code root of this code and um, then take the product of it with something that's kind of not in the image of the transpose of the parity check matrix. So something that's kind of not in the image. So something that can't be expressed by just choosing some vertices here and looking at their neighborhoods over here. And so we, we take products like that. But it's assuming that since this matrix kind of isn't surjective, we will have some rows here where um, we can just paste it in the logic operator. So yeah, I definitely glossed over that. So. Thank you. Uh, um, you said that morally, I should think of the asymptotic properties as related to expansion. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that. And also, what does expansion mean in this tripartite setting? Right. So yeah, that was definitely a vague um, statement. I think some of the, so there have been some bounds that show that um, like spatial locality or locality in certain topologies are incompatible with high distance. And I think, I guess I'm not too familiar with this work. I'm sure there's people here that are who better describe them. But my impression is that these works are um, using some sort of graph property that is kind of similar to expansion, like some sort of graph separator property, and showing that this serves as an impediment to, to good distance. So some sort of bad expansion or like bad cuts in the graph serve as, can serve as impediments. I think can serve as impediments to good distance in the code. Um, I think that's really all I was trying to say. And then should I just think of expansion as the expansion of, like, I take my tripartite graph and I think of it as two different bipartite graphs and the expansion properties in both? Or is there some more complex notion you need to think about? Um, yeah, so I'm not exactly sure. I think kind of I think different works have used different notions. Um, but yeah, so I think it's in at some sense it's just this kind of property that yeah, in this literal tripartite graph, small sets have large neighborhoods. Um, but yeah, I don't wanna I, I, I don't wanna say something wrong, so I don't know exactly what the notion is. So you, you mentioned that like the low weight checks give rise to these short cycles. But classically, this doesn't happen. In an LDPC code, you can have a like, large curve in your tanner graph despite having constant weight checks. So like what's happening here? Oh, yeah. So um, right. So classically, I guess there will still be cycles of like logarithmic size. Um, so these cycles will not lead to kind of small logically equivalent errors, I guess. Um, so I guess quantumly, the point is these low weight stabilizers um, they yield small cycles, which give kind of low weight errors that are logically equivalent. Or another way of saying that is stabilizers give low weight errors that actually don't affect the code at all. So you can't detect the error or correct the error. Classically, for any low weight error, um, which would still, or classically, there just are no low weight errors. So somehow, because the Tanner graph is bipartite, um, a low weight cycle in a classical Tanner graph doesn't directly give you kind of a low weight error that is undetectable. I see, so it's like the tripartite S. Yeah. I think for certain decoders, like I think for BP, um, I'm under the impression that small cycles can still be a problem. Um, but at least for like this, the very simple flip decoder I described, um, small cycles, at least asymptotically in theory, are not a proper a problem classically. It's more when you get into this tripartite. <laughs> And then just like, a, so if you run small set flip classically, does it improve over those bit flipping algorithms for like classical LDPC codes? Do you know? Or? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know. 
Any one last quick question? Yeah, um, quick question. On your uh, twisting uh, slides, you mentioned um, some of the recent works. I think the quantum mechanical codes stuff is on there. I, my question was, uh, can we recognize that twisting phenomenon as happening in those codes? Is, I mean, is that, is that what you meant by putting that on the slide? Um, the twisting, in, sorry, in which codes? In the... uh, so on your slide where you talked about the twisting to increase the minimum distance, and then you know, I think the reference is yeah, right there, exactly. So going beyond uh, the square root and distance, um, applying similar ideas. Yeah, so my question was, like, like, after the fact, if we look at those constructions, do we see this twisting phenomenon happening? That, that's my question. I see. So I think, yes, so I'm not gonna, I don't wanna, I think what people were pointing out earlier is that the way I described the twisting is not a perfect analog to what's going on in these constructions. But actually it's the same thing. So you can kind of just take a double cover, right? And then you kind of factor out something that gives you the twist. So it's still the same thing. So you kind of start something which is like twice as big, and then you kind of reduce the size of the So it's still, it's still exactly the same thing. So I think what, yeah, I mean, I guess, and more specifically, somebody else a reference that describes that topological that you're interested in. Sorry, I don't know a reference. So yeah, I think, when, just maybe just to reiterate for the mic, I think what Nico's saying is, if you take what I said and kind of modify the way I presented a little, a little, then it would be exactly the same. Sorry, I don't know a reference. Okay, so let's thank Rui again.